Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Please sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com for weekly updates about my podcasts, events, and more. Also, follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and also at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. And finally, join my virtual book club called Zibby's Virtual Book Club, which meets every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time until 3 p.m. and features half an hour of book club discussion followed by 30 minutes of Q&A with the author whose book we've just discussed. You can sign up on my website, zibbyowens.com, under the virtual book club section, or even on Instagram under the link in my bio. I hope you'll find me in all these different channels and enjoy this podcast. Hi, listeners. I am so excited because Fairy is back as a sponsor this week. As you may know from listening to previous episodes, I am obsessed with Faraday and their clothing. I discovered this little store in the Pacific Palisades Village Mall in LA, and my husband Kyle and I just went crazy. They have amazing men's clothes and women's clothes that are so soft and great fabrics and colors and everything else, and I have been a fan for so long. So when they approached me to be um, a sponsor, I was like over the moon. Um, um, they even did a little website for me on fairdybrand.com slash Zibby. So go to fairdy, spelled F-A-H-E-R-T-Y, brand.com slash Zibby, and you get 25% off all their clothes, which I have definitely used, and I have to stop at this point, but I keep buying their cozy sweaters and dresses that go with leggings, and um, I have this turtleneck light sort of brownish Heather Gray, I'm not describing it very well, but anyway, um, dress-ish thing that I've been wearing almost every day. Um, Kyle wears these jacket slash polo, um, not polo, button-down shirts, um, sort of indoor, outdoor. Um, I mean, we're stuck in the house anyway right now, but anyway, you have to go get 25% off with code Zibby, fairtybrand.com. Go check out their clothes. You'll see why I'm obsessed. I'm kind of sad to be revealing this little secret brand that I thought that we had only just discovered, but turns out a lot of people know about, and now you do too. So go check it out. And thanks, Fairty, for being a sponsor. Peace Adzo Mehdi is a scholar and writer. She is senior lecturer in gender and international politics at the University of Bristol. Her research addresses gender politics and conflict in Africa. Her book, Global Norms and Local Action, The Campaigns to End Violence Against Women in Africa, was published in March 2020 by Oxford University Press. Her debut novel, His Only Wife, which is what we're going to talk about the most, was published in September 2020 by Algonquin Books and selected as the October pick for Reese's Book Club. Mehdi's research has been supported by grants from the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation, and the Social Science Research Council, and have been published in many journals. Her work has won several awards, including the 2019 Best Paper Award, and her short stories have appeared in Slice Magazine, Transition, Four Wave Review, and elsewhere. She's also the co-editor of African Affairs, the top-ranked African Studies Journal, and is a research fellow at the University of Ghana. She earned a BA in geography from the University of Ghana and an MA in international studies from Ohio University and a PhD in public and international affairs from the University of Pittsburgh. I think that's all you need to know about peace and you can see how immensely accomplished she is. So accomplished that I cannot even read her bio perfectly and she has lived it. Welcome, Peace. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss your book, His Only Wife. Congratulations on the book. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I have to say, I listened to this in the car on a bunch of drives that I did, and I had it with all the kids in the car, and it was like, you know, and I would listen back and forth, back and forth. And then I finally said, oh, you know what, guys? Like, this is the book we've been listening to. And they were like, it's so short. What do you mean? We've been listening to it for hours. So <laughs> anyway, it's been like a part of my family. So I'm happy to tell them that we're finally doing this interview. <laughs> okay. Okay, so can you please tell listeners what His Only Wife is about and also what inspired you to write this book? Mm. So His Only Wife is a story of a young woman in Ghana. Her name is Afi, and she is in an arranged marriage, or it begins with Afi in getting into an arranged marriage to a man, and his name is Ellie, very wealthy man. And this is a marriage that has been arranged by Ellie's mother, who is called Auntie, and Auntie has arranged this marriage because she does not approve of Ellie's partner. So on one level, Afi has this task of 
bringing Ellie closer to his family because the woman has come between Ellie and his family. But on another level, this is a book about a young woman finding her voice, finding her place in the world and coming to a place where she can speak about what it is that she wants. So that is his only wife. And I wrote the book for several reasons. One being that I'm very interested in how social pressures shape women's lives. And so I I do research on a variety of issues, including on violence against women. And I've done some field work in Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire. And I've spoken to survivors of violence. And something that came through in my interviews with them was how they were very much, they wanted to leave abusive relationships, but didn't because people encouraged them to stay and people discouraged them from leaving, usually family and friends. And so that really got me thinking about the decisions that women make in relationships because of the pressures and the advice that they receive from the people around them. All very good things to investigate. <laughs> you know, I read this, this is going to sound so silly. Well, maybe not silly, just surprising, I should say. There was an ad for a dog food company. And in the ad, it said 47% of domestic abuse victims don't leave because they don't want to leave their pets isn't that interesting? Oh, really? Yeah. So I don't know. I just keep like storing this fact away and repeating it because I find it so interesting that you can feel so trapped and so helpless and be in such an awful emotional and physical place. And yet your allegiance to your pet is placed at a higher premium almost than your own mental and physical health. I don't know. I found it very interesting. But it, 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 I think it, it makes sense that if you're in such a difficult position... That's something that brings you joy, something that brings you a bit of comfort. It's something that will be very difficult to part with. Yes. I mean, I couldn't part with my dog. Do you have dogs? I mean, do you have any? Not anymore. Not anymore. Yeah. Well, I just inherited a dog and I'm already in love with her after like a month. So, Uh, (laughs) So, and also you were the Reese's book club pick, which was such a, just must've been so exciting, right? What did, did you even, was that even on the horizon of things you were hoping would happen with this book? Or did you, what, what happened when you found out? Tell me about that. Well, I, I hoped briefly before I ever knew. And then I thought, oh, don't, don't, don't even think about that. What are the chances that would happen? So it was a, an extremely pleasant surprise. And honestly, I found out and I had no idea what to do with myself. I was almost just frozen. I was like, what what do I do with this information? I'm so, so happy. What do I do with this information? But, you know, it's the Reese Book Club community. They're just a wonderful community of book lovers. And they have been so supportive in so many different ways. So it's just, it's been wonderful being the October Book Club pick. Oh, it's exciting. And I was watching you today because I was wondering if they had posted, well, our interview will air later, but a lot of places were airing their November picks today. So I was on there and watching you give all the clues. And I was thinking to myself, does Peace know the answer to this or did they just give her the clues? Do you know the answer or did you just get the clues? They, they just give me the clues. So oh, okay. I thought like everyone like reading their responses like, oh, okay. Is this what people think it is? I just know the clues. <laughs> well, everybody in the comments seemed to be pretty convinced it was one particular book, but I don't know. Well, they'll all, I, you know, they all wanted that free giveaway, I guess. So they <laughs> hopped on the bandwagon. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll find out today. Yes, exactly. Yeah. This book was so like realistic, particularly the scenes where Afi was Afi. in the apartment just biding her time, waiting for Ellie to come visit. And she didn't know what to do. And luckily she was able through Richard and her family to go take some sewing classes and like go to different schools and all the rest. But for a while it was just her with the thick carpet and her mom and alone, like padding around and wondering if she should be like dressed and ready and what was going to happen for her husband to show up who she hadn't even seen since including at the wedding which is crazy yeah tell me about like crafting that moment and that feeling like did you have a period of time where you felt that same sense of like that the minutes were so long because that's how you made it feel for the character yeah, I think I've, I've, I've definitely felt like that when waiting for, for things to happen. But I just, I really wanted to communicate the things that women do for men <laughs> and the sacrifices 
that women would make for men, including a woman like Afi, who is ambitious, who is smart, but has been led to believe that you know, she should make these sacrifices. She should be willing, she should be ready and prepared and perfect looking all the time in order to, to please this man. Who she's, had, she's never even like met officially since they've been married. Yeah. So in, in crafting that period in Afi's life, I just really wanted to show this excruciating detail of just, of just waiting and, and waiting because you've, you've been led to believe that this person is so important and you should give so much of yourself to this person. By the way, when Ellie did finally arrive, and as I said, I was listening in the car with the kids, and they finally got together, and I, my, my daughter was like, Mom! And so I like, turned it down. I was like, I'm sure the scene's almost over. So then, like, I turned it back up, and they had, like, gone out to the kitchen, and then you had them, like, go back in the bedroom, and it started again, and she's like, <laughs> okay, man. I was like, okay, okay, okay. I'll do it later. Oh, what have I done? <laughs> I was like so mortified. But anyway, so mental note, don't listen to this like middle part, you know, in front of your kids. But (laughs) oh my gosh, you know, part of the book too was not only her allegiance really to Ellie, but also the sort of like post-mortem allegiance to her father because her father passed away leaving the family in sort of financial ruins and she had to live with her aunt and felt indebted to her aunt for a long time. And this is part of why, you know, She wanted to repay the aunt, but it's the loss of not only her father, but also the lifestyle that her father provided and sort of what it's like to have been, you know, somewhat frivolous with her purchases and not really thinking. And then you had a whole thing where, you know, she's like, what if only I could go back and, you know, have, have a moment of those clothes that I didn't care about or all of that. And just like, hold on to those, not knowing that they were about to go away. So tell me a little more about that element and the kind of fall from grace that can so easily happen. Yeah. So a big part of this story is the class divide. I really wanted to show that. And I've thought about it and said, would auntie have proposed this marriage if Afi's father was alive, if they were middle class, I don't think so. And I think it's because of Afi's financial, the family's financial situation. That is why Auntie felt bold enough to propose this this marriage. But I just really wanted to explore how economic disparities impact the decisions that women make, but also even how it shapes marriages. Because then you, you have a relationship where one person has more power than the other because that person has the money and is therefore then able to call the shots. So I, I just really wanted in, in small ways to show how the death of Afi's father and the, their financial falling kind of was dri- even driving the behavior of her mother. Because mm-hmm. I think her mother would have been a very different woman if Afi fa- Afi's father had been alive. And I just really wanted to explore this and show how the change in their financial status was influencing them in different ways. And also how the mom and daughter's different views on what a marriage should be affected their relationship, that they used to be more like friends. And then as soon as she got married, it became, you know, much more mother, daughter, I'm going to tell you what to do. You have to do this sort of a didactic type relationship and how a a wedding, a relationship, I mean, as we all know, can seriously change your other relationships, Mm -hmm. right? In -hmm. in unforeseen ways. (laughs) Yes, yes. And because a big part of it is Afi's mother has an idea of what a marriage should be. And Afi starts off disagreeing, but then agreeing and then disagreeing. But definitely along those lines, we see the the relationship between Afi and her mother change in, in, in so many ways. And I think that's it's actually very, very realistic. When, once money comes into the picture, a lot mm-hmm. of our relationships tend to change. That too, yes, for sure. <laughs> Tell me about, so are you married yourself? This is none of my business. You don't have to answer. I'm wondering if you're married, if your parents are married, like what types of models for a marriage like do you have in your own life? Models for marriage. Well, so this is a, th- I think this book is unusual in two ways in that it, it's an arranged marriage. And I tell people that it's actually not, common where I come from at least 
So a lot of it was me imagining what an arranged marriage would look like and what a person in an arranged marriage would feel. But it's also kind of a, a polygamous relationship where you have one man with, with multiple partners or wanting to have multiple wives and not, I guess, entirely succeeding. And that is also not as common as it used to be in Ghana. And, and these relationships still exist, but they are not as common as they used to be. So what, what I would say is that I'm not in an arranged or in a polygamous <laughs> marriage, but I'm, I'm very interested in these institutions. I'm very interested in why people are within these institutions, but also how they have changed and why they are changing. Because, I mean, I think if I look at my grandmother's generation, for example, there were more re relationships or marriages with more than one partner, with more than one wife. But in my generation, my parents' generation, it's become much less common. And to me, it's, it's very interesting, but it also says a lot about, I guess, what, women, what women's expectations are and what women are willing to accept within marriage as well in Ghana, and I'm sure in many other places. Interesting. So tell me about the writing of this book. How long did it take you to write? And like, what was your process like? Mm. So I, I began thinking about this book around 2010, 2011. I was finishing up my doctoral dissertation at Boston College. And I was spending a lot of time just sitting at my desk trying to write the dissertation and graduate. By the way, I had this vision of you in Ghana, like writing with all the sights and sounds the way they are in the book. And you're like in freezing cold Boston around the corner. That's crazy. But OK, go on. Go on. Well, some of the writing did happen in Ghana, but I began thinking about it when I was in Boston. And then I seriously began writing late 2012, early 2013, and I was back in Ghana by then. And it took me five years because I went back and started teaching at the University of Ghana. And so I had a full-time job where I was doing academic research and writing, teaching and everything else, but also writing fiction. So I had kind of a very hectic day. So I wake up at four in the morning, write fiction. Oh my gosh. And around six in the morning, I would switch to writing. On. I no longer do that, thankfully. <laughs> and then switch to nonfiction around six. So it was very demanding, but I, I really enjoyed it because fiction is how I, I use fiction to relax. I use fiction to step back from my academic work. So whilst, I mean, there were very long days, it was very enjoyable. Well, that's good. <laughs> and what are you working on now? Well, I'm in the final stages. I'm, I'm uh, editing the second book manuscript. And I was supposed to be done Monday morning. I told my agent I was going to send it to her yesterday morning. And I haven't. <laughs> it's only Tuesday. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I'm finishing up that manuscript and excited about the third one. Wow. Can you, can you give any previews as to what those two are about? Well, yes. So the, the second book is about friendship and is about two cousins who are very close. So I'm very interested in how relationships come apart. Mm -hmm. And so it's two cousins who are very close, but then this, they come apart over time. And I, I explore why it is that this happens and I'm also interested in how two people can experience the same thing, but think about it very differently. So while uh, two friends, they are both convinced that the other person is in the wrong. <laughs> and for me, that is just so interesting. So basically, it's a book about friendship. Great. Well, that sounds good. Definitely been in situations where I'm convinced I'm right and perhaps I'm not. So that will be good. <laughs> Do you have any advice to aspiring authors? Oh, I think it's important that you love what you're writing. For me, that has worked really well because writing is this long hours, very demanding. And I think that if you don't love what you're doing, if you don't love the story that you are telling, I think it will be really tough to just stick with it for years and years. Like I've been working on this book. If I count editing it's almost nine years, almost 10 years. And I feel like if you don't love the story, if you don't love the characters, it will be just hard to keep at it. 
So write the things that make you happy, write the things that you, you love. And I guess eventually the writing will find its readers. That's excellent advice. Well, this book has certainly found a lot of readers, so that's that's great, <laughs> including me and apparently my kids. So, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for all of our hours of entertainment on the in the car, and thank you for chatting with me today. Thanks for this beautiful story and and all of its different elements that really made me think. So, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I've enjoyed chatting with you. You too. Have a great day. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks again to Faraday for being a sponsor today. Go to faradaybrand.com slash Zivi and get 25% off. Enter code Zivi for 25% off these amazing, comfy winter clothes and summer, but for now winter, and you will thank me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Mm-hmm.